Please listen carefully. Well, hello, universe, and welcome to the Optimist Daily Update. I'm Christy Jansen. And I'm Summers McKay. And we are part of the team behind the Optimist Daily, making solutions the news. We bring you reader-funded solutions news every day in order to change the tenor of news media, social media, and the direction of your day to get us all focused on solutions. Seven days a week, we publish positive news stories written by award-winning journalists and delivered online to your inbox and through our social channels. And also, we are sharing these solutions in a commute-worthy, walk-worthy, home office-worthy, talk about it with your family at Thanksgiving-worthy podcast. Today is Friday, the 19th of November, 2021. Hello, Christy. How are you today? Good morning, Summers. I am feeling pretty chipper, I have to say. Ooh, I like chipper. Yeah. Chipper okay. is good. That's different. That I mean, not that you're not always positive and in a good mood, but chipper, that's a new word for you. What What's making you feel so chipper today? Well, you know what it is? In the last couple of weeks, I've actually had the chance to meet people in person a couple mm. of times. Mm-hmm. And uh, yesterday I participated in a luncheon for an organization called Human Rights Watch, which was really interesting. It was a small group of people and it was outside, but I find it so stimulating to be in conversation, to be meeting new people who I haven't known and have deep conversations mm-hmm. with. Yeah. And for me, that's one of the the real losses of this last year and a half is losing that ability to connect with people that I didn't know before. Right, right. On well, top of losing the ability to just easily hug with people yeah, that I know. But <laughs> I likewise had the opportunity to uh, have a couple friends over who also have children at my daughter's school, came over for for a a pizza and a mom's night. And I have to say, as far as being a hostess goes, I was sort of all thumbs, right? I'm so used to just being busy and moving around and chasing my daughter and caring for the kids that I actually kind of ended up in the playroom hanging out with the kids while the other moms talked. <laughs> and Ooh. I realized <laughs> that I I don't know how to have conversations anymore. I mean, I, I, I do, but in, in person and I don't know how to manage I get a lot it. Of things. And I I feel like this guest that we are talking to today might yes. be able to help me. Well, I was going you. to say that. It's lucky for you, we have an expert conversational guide person here with us. Mm -hmm. I know that's an awkward way of introducing Joan, but we're so excited to have Joan Blades on the pod today. And let me just tell you a little bit about her. She's the co-founder of an organization called Living Room Conversation. You can find that at livingroomconversations.org. But it's an open source effort to rebuild respectful discourse across ideological, cultural, and party lines while embracing our shared values. Because, as she says, when we care about each other, we work to find ways to meet each other's core needs. And so she's going to be our guest today. She's also a co-founder of MomsRising.org and MoveOn.org. She's really great at getting things started and getting people to come together to try to address big problems. Um, And so, Joan, welcome to the pod. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Did I leave anything off in my little short description of where you are coming from and, and, and what you do? I, you know, I think the only thing I'd say about Living Room Conversations is co-founding that. I co-founded oh. it with a conservative and independent. <laughs> okay. So there was three of you who co-founded Living Room Conversations. One area we're, we're going to want to get into is how to come back together with our families over this upcoming holiday season, especially Thanksgiving, which is just around the corner. But before we dig into that, I wanted to talk about Living Room Conversations and the mission that you're working on there, and also what it is, why it is, and also how you feel like it's been impacting the world since you've started it. That's a long list you have. So um, how did you meet your co-founders and how did you decide to sort of come together to create this. Okay. So as a founder of Move On, I've been in the progressive movement for a long time. And in 2004, I got together with a group called Reuniting America, which was getting leadership across the political spectrum together to talk about all sorts of things. And I was particularly concerned about climate change. And it's like, why aren't conservatives concerned about this? 
And I was able to have some great conversations about climate change at that time. By 2008 or 2009, that was less possible. And as a founder of Move On, I'm a deep believer in the power of the grassroots and the foundational nature of having grassroots support. So living room conversations are an opportunity for people all around the country to have their own good conversations with people that see things differently. Now, it's a big lift because what we've seen is so many people have seen bad interactions that they're concerned about trying to have a living room conversation. (laughs) And the original design was two friends with differences, each invite two friends for a living room conversation. I live in Berkeley, so when I want to have a conversation with conservatives, I have to be very intentional about it. And it's those conversations, though, are just eye-opening and kind of wonderful because we discover that we like each other. Again and again, that's what people discover. So we started having those conversations in a pilot project in 2010. And by 2013, we were starting to really move out into the world with them. And we've got over 100 conversation guides. And what we learned really quickly was we can talk about all sorts of things. And actually, if you want to have a conversation about climate with people that don't believe in climate, you should talk about energy because they're not going to show up to a conversation about climate. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. We had energy and climate, but it's, you know, you have to start where people are Mm -hmm. and we have to just listen to each other. The power of listening is something that continues to impress me, that when we really give people our attention and we're truly curious and we're not on a mission to persuade, that's actually the most effective thing we can do to create connection and cause people to shift some in many cases because we begin to understand each other and care about each other. And human beings are first about our emotions and then our brains justify things. So we keep on thinking we're rational beings and that's what we think. But The science would suggest that, no, really, first, we are about the emotion in the vast majority of our decision-making processes. Well, I think that's such an important observation to make, and I want to really understand that. You also have a background as a mediator. You have training in helping people come together and bridge, like, sometimes really bitter divides. Did that come into your understanding on, on creating this kind of a an op- open source living room conversation? It's definitely model? my origin. <laughs> I mean, it, just language is so important. I was <laughs> way back when a uh, divorce mediator. And if you just think about it, if you refer to the mother of your child or your ex-wife, what are the emotions that brings up? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Calling somebody the mother of your child, there's there's affection and an appreciation, right? But your ex-wife is a, about the rupture and about all the things that was the failure of the relationship. Yeah. And the mother of my child means I'm going to have a relationship with this person right. for the rest of my life. And I've got to figure this out. I think that's so graceful in, you know, bringing sort of mediation into conversations. Uh my husband and I actually fall on different sides of the uh, political spectrum. We have over time learned that we have more in common than we originally thought. But oftentimes I engage in conversations with friends who just say, you know, I can't believe you're married to a person who votes differently than you. I can't, you know, how do you resolve these differences? And in the most recent uh, political turmoil, it became very difficult for us. We actually had to just stop talking about politics entirely. And I have found that prior to that, we could have some pretty good conversations and learn from one another, but we really have put up a boundary between the two of us. 
Now, when you were coming together for living room conversations, you made a concerted effort to bring people with different ideological backgrounds together. How has it changed over time? And what in particular do you suggest for families who do have, you know, pretty substantial political differences? The polarization has been amplified more and more over the last decade, two decades, honestly. Move Uh on. People have forgotten that it actually started around the impeachment scandal and it was a one sentence petition. Congress Mm. must immediately censor the the president and move on to pressing issues facing the nation. And this was the original original impeachment of Bill Clinton. Yeah. We had thousands of Republicans sign that. Yep. And it was about this is what's good for the country. We need to censure and move on. And the theory at that time was Congress had work to do that they could get done. Mm -hmm. We're at a point today where, you know, getting work done in D.C. has become more and more difficult. And we're blaming the other side perpetually. And I must admit, the beauty of the living room conversations is I can still be a progressive living in Berkeley (laughs) and show up full heartedly as a progressive but really also show up full-heartedly as someone that cares and wants to understand what these divisions are and to find a way to move forward together with mutual respect, understanding faith communities have expressed it most perfectly, seeing the divinity in everyone. Uh And take us through the process a little bit on how that actually works, because I know that some of your conversations put these kinds of divisions front and center, but some of them are maybe coming at it from a slightly oblique direction. Like you're talking about when you want to talk about the environment with or the climate change with a conservative, you start with energy. Where do you start if, you know, Summers and her husband were going to have a conversation about politics, where would they start? And how, how could they have a safe conversation that felt compelling and safe? Well, the conversation agreements that we have are very simple and people are really good at them (laughs) in general. Be curious and open to learning. Conversation is much about listening as it is about talking. Enjoy hearing all points of view. Maintain an attitude of exploration. That's the first agreement. Show respect and suspend judgments. The second, find common ground and note differences. It's the third, be authentic and welcome that from others. The next, be purposeful to the point. It's the next, and own and guide the conversation. Everyone in the conversation shares responsibility. And the living room conversations are a very specific container that start with the set of agreements about respect, curiosity, and listening. Just expand a little bit on own the conversation, that everyone is responsible. And I think in some ways, it's not only taking responsibility, but giving responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, people always say, well, you can't invite so-and-so. And it's true. When you have a living room conversation, you don't invite someone that you know can't take these agreements and abide by them. Mm. The vision for living room conversations and the greater bridging movement is that we're going to get millions of people engaged. 3.5% of the population has been shown to be a number that can often create culture change. And I think we're very much in need of culture change. Most people are not happy with the division we have right now. They want to live in a connected and kind society. Mm -hmm. And there's this sense of being at odds at all times that's incredibly stressful. We are not enjoying this, but we don't know how to get out. And this is an invitation to start on the way out. And that's why this is open source. Yes, it's only six people at a time or four or five if you do less. But you could have 10,000 conversations or 100,000 conversations in a weekend. And we have faith communities and libraries and even bookstores and bakeries 
that do living room conversations and schools. Have you been seeing any impact? If there have been studies done that show that it actually does start to move the needle in a positive way in terms of bringing cohesion into a community or into a family or into a church group? Like, have you done those kinds of follow up? We did an 18 month study with Fetzer, which started in 2019. And, you know, we tried to do the deep dive and the higher level. And what was revealed in part was that they do have the effect we're looking for, both short term and longer term, which is about better conversation skills and more nuance and understanding. In terms of long term impact upon a community, love to have someone that can do the deep dive on that story. We do know that one reason some faith communities use the conversations is there are differences within the faith community. And what I love about faith communities is they're typically the place people are going to be their best selves. Mm -hmm. Think about who they want to be in the world. So it's a super appropriate place for these conversations to be used and spread. There's a evangelical community in Idaho that started using them internally and then invited people from outside the community to come and join the conversations. I should mention with the research, they also found that those good impacts were both in person and by video because we've been doing video for years Mm -hmm. before COVID too. So and and that's really uh, taken off. And all of us have become somewhat expert now in being on a video conference call. And it's interesting. And you know, Joan, you and I actually had a living room conversation last week. And I want to just talk a little bit about what happened in that for me and get your uh, sort of your reaction or share that with with our audience because it was uh, you and I and in we you know you could say that you and I were the two hosts, right? Because I brought two people into the conversation and you brought two people into the conversation. And so it was, it was six of us and we were mostly located in California West coast. Although there was one person who you, who came with you, Pedro, who was sitting in Colorado and he's of the faith community. Yes. You and me. And then you brought John who was actually from a conservative perspective, but one of your partners in living room conversation. And it was such a, intelligent conversation I found and interesting to be a part of. Well, Christy, I'm going to, I'm going to back you and Joan up a tiny bit okay. because you yeah. guys are both, you guys are both so familiar yeah. with the concept. Yeah, tell, one what of the thing, questions you have. Yeah. So, I was going to say yeah. one thing that we have missed is just like a very brief discussion description of what living room conversations are. And from my understanding, they are orchestrated conversations where everyone agrees to the the principles right the rules of rules of discussion and comes together with different perspectives to discuss review talk about something and share their different ideological perspective inputs where they sit in the world on how they can reflect on that so Go after ahead, the conversation agreements we have three rounds that everybody okay. gets through. And the first round has a few questions. People choose one of them. And those questions tend to get people talking about some of their deeper values. So they're like conversation, deep value conversation starters, basically. Yeah, deep value conversation starters. So by the time we get to the topic that has been chosen, Mm -hmm. and as I said, we have over 100 topic guides, and they've all been reviewed by our review team so that there's welcoming across differences as possible. Um, By the time we get to that topic, I'm having a sense of, huh, I kind of like this person, or I'm starting to see that person as your friend's friend or just someone new that you're interested in getting to know. Right. Now, that it starts is so interesting that the the conversation begins with not, you know, here's what I think, but it's here's who I am. Right. Yes. And that yeah. humanizes it because it's so easy to dehumanize the other side. And so initiating these conversations with a humanizing sort of values conversation starter, I've, I love that. What happens next? Yeah. 
Then we have a set of questions on the topic at hand that are about your personal relationship with the topic, because we don't want people to get into talking points. We want them to tell their stories. For example, one of the most difficult topics for some people is guns. We have a guns and responsibility conversation that will ask questions about, you know, your relationship with guns, how they have impacted you, what it was like, how did you learn about guns when you were a child? How interesting. Now, Christy, what was your conversation topic? So, yeah, I wanted to um, also explain how when, when I was inviting the people that I brought into the conversation, I wanted to get a very, a younger voice in the, in the room. So I invited my friend, Mark, who's a 21 year old environmental studies major here at UCSB. And he was, he's a great conversationalist. He's a super sharp young guy, but he was nervous about being in a room with all these like older professional smart people. Like, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. He said, I'm like, it's not about what you know, it's about how you feel. And one of the things that I just wanted to reflect on that you keep explaining when you're talking about the process, it always starts with the person in the room and their experience, their lived experience and how they're relating to the topic. And I just think that's one of the things that makes it so opening as opposed to closing down in terms yeah. of conversation. The conversation we ended up talking about was about American aspirations and the idea of America. Part of that was because one of the people in the room had just been writing about and talking about and almost ranting about the fact that we're heading towards a civil war. And I, I wanted to bring that out and bring it out and see what would happen when we when we kind of workshopped it in this conversation. What did you think about that, Joan? <laughs> you know, I thought it was very interesting, the diversity of opinions there. <laughs> and mm -hmm. that, you know, for my friend John, who's from Kentucky, though he now lives in the Bay Area, you know, some of the suggestions there were like, ooh. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it caused him to go, you know, yeah, wow, that's how people feel when they're triggered. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and the uh, thing I found interesting about from his perspective is that he lives, his reaction was that he almost was in a different reality, a different world. The intensity of some of the political discourse maybe has been heard differently from different people in where they sit on the political spectrum and also where they sit in the country. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. I was, I was, it was refreshing to hear John's take because he was far more optimistic than some of the other people in the room. <laughs> and, the, and I also was so fascinated by Mark, who was the young, my young friend, because he was very curious where he felt America was really failing was in its relationship to capitalism and money. And I just thought that was, and that was a very different reaction than the rest of us in the room. So that was, it was fascinating. So everyone talks about their alignment with a topic, right? And um, Christy, I think I'm, so, I wish I had been a fly on the wall in this conversation, but so everyone talks about their alignment experience with a topic and then what happens? And I feel like I'm just like peeling back the layer of this delicious onion right now because I want to know more. What happens after that? Then it's just reflection on the conversation. Typically, mm. we try to have 90-minute conversations. You can do it shorter, but you don't go as deep because things need a chance to cook, <laughs> yes. you know? Yes. A lot of people say, okay, let's have a next conversation. I have one group that is just, amazing started with uh the healthy conflict living room conversation and just goes deeper mm -hmm. every time so uh, let's jump off from the healthy conflict because i think that that might be a good place to launch into how do we bring this into our own homes how do we bring it into our own our actual living rooms when we have different generations coming together for example well, the reality is a living room conversation is a very specific container that you're not going to have a living room conversation <laughs> when you have, you know, your holiday meals. But what you do have is additional skills and the ability to choose the way you participate in the conversation, what you bring to the conversation, because Families are the most difficult place, honestly, 
to have a living room conversation in some ways because you've got all this history. Whereas we are really polite with guests and friends, sometimes we're not as polite with our family, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's that's the biggest risk, right? We we don't follow rules with our family. We feel like it's the one place we don't have to. But we do need to be careful with our family members, too, don't we? Yeah. Well, you know, some people are choosing to have, you know, conversations with family members now, and it's really helping them. So whereas we used to say, well, family's the one place we're not sure. We're saying family can be great, but there are different issues you you yourself are going to know about more than anyone else does about what the strengths and weaknesses of your family's communication are. Mm-hmm. The reason for open source is because, you know, we have some cultural competence, but every community has their own cultural confidence that goes deeper. And these conversations are being used worldwide. It's just this team is U.S. focused. Right? Yeah. But you have a, you do on your website have a friends and family conversation tip sheet and also a, a toolkit for holiday conversations. <laughs> and some of these are great, right? There's connecting across generations, building better conversations, sharing hopes and asks. I mean, th- this goes deep. These toolkits, Joan, how did you guys create them and how do you want people to use them? Well, uh, we have so many people that have said this really helped. I, you know, had the best conversation with my father I've had in years or my nephew. And we realized that even though they aren't living room conversations people are having, you can really improve the quality of the conversations you've had just by how you step into the room and choose to interact. And so the friends and family tip sheet kind of says, okay, you got more to deal with with the family because you've got that history, but they're also the people that are so important to you. So having great conversations with them is really powerful. And in some ways, maybe family is going to show up when other people won't now because people are more scared to talk. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the building connection uh, tips? I think they're so important. And there are tips that are going to work for any conversation, but maybe it can lower the temperature. By you asking that question, I think you have some favorites. So I'm curious (laughs) what your favorites are. Well, my personal just part of it is is verifying and acknowledging feelings, which I feel like is a really important thing when we're talking with children. I both Summers and I have teenage kids and Often when we're talking, when people talk to their children, they tell them how they feel instead of listening to how they feel. And I feel like that sometimes is, um, it shuts down conversation as opposed to opening it up. So listening and asking as opposed to expecting one way of feeling, but that's exactly what this to me talks about. I think my, one of my favorites goes back to the basics, Christy, which is to try to understand, not convince or persuade. Right. Uh, so often I find, because I, I come from a family of vehement opinion havers, and we forget that a conversation is about listening, not lecturing. And I find this is very common in families, right? That the, uh, the adult is, you know, the the senior person is the lecturer. And then as the child comes up in their age and has more agency to their own opinion, then they are lecturing back. And all you have are these two sort of strong forces shouting their opinions at one another, as opposed to trying to understand the other person's opinion. Yeah. And it's a generational experience that mm-hmm. uh, we talk, Joan, we, Christy and I talk a lot about not passing on generational trauma. Right. Just because like you may have had a grandfather who was very edictorial, you shouldn't likewise be edictorial to your children. And I think that that idea of reminding everyone sitting at the table, the goal is understanding, not convincing. I'm sure, Joan, there are people in families who like fight that. How can we help people remember that? Well, I think modeling it is Mm -hmm. often the very best thing you can do. 
Mm-hmm. And honestly, with uh, people in certain age brackets and personality types, they're not going to get it. Right. And it's just being accepting and loving people where they're at. Mm-hmm. At the core of this is, you know, we need to love our family and, you know, the relationships do come first. And maybe you can have a really curious, deep conversation with some folks in your family. And maybe, you know, there are a few people that you can get them talking about something they like. Right. And, and that, to me, listen back. <laughs> that, but that also leads to another really important tip, which is about keeping the tone light and using humor, which I feel like sometimes that can diffuse the situation in a way that nothing else can. Sometimes it's it's not good to go deep. Sometimes it's nicer to just stay light in a, in positive. Yeah. (laughs) In those kind of tense moments. Well, I, I loved Amelia's comment before we started this, that she was going to print out some of the friends and family guides, like the topics of conversation and put them at places on the table and uh, <laughs> offer them to everyone, you know, print them out in bright orange paper and share. When, when we approach family conversations, I think it's fun, you know, the idea of maybe getting buy-in from a few people in your family. Just, Joan, as you were saying, not everyone is going to be this person, but maybe advance the conversation, share this discussion. Go to livingroomconversations.org and send those family members who are on the side of open discussion and who are receptive. Maybe we get this to them ahead of time for the mm-hmm. meetings. I, I, you know, my Chris, my family Christmas is 45 people and um, that's huge for us, right? We do it every other year. And I just kind of laugh at the idea if I sent this to everybody, everyone would be like, oh, great. Summers is giving us homework again. But I know that there are probably 10 people in the family who would love this resource. And I think, you know, seeding seeding good conversations with as many people as possible is a really good strategy. Which some of reminds you could do is have a video living room conversations with some of your favorite family members just for fun. Mm -hmm. Because we have a lot of really fun conversations. You don't have to go into the, the difficult ones to start with. And there's some just beautiful values conversations, too. I think that you've got um, trainings on how people can become a host and get comfortable with the with the whole format that are available online. Is that is that something that people can sign up for? Yes, we do an intro to living room conversations once a month. We have host training and we have a special host training for people that want to do the race and equity work. That said. The conversation guides there, many people just take them and run with them. You don't right. need to do the host training. We also have videos of living room conversations. You know, some people said, okay, you can record me. And so, you know, check out the forgiveness living room conversation. I think it's just amazing, for instance. Oh, so oh that's- forgiveness. We go back and forth and back <laughs> and forth on what forgiveness means. I, Christy, I think we need to have one of those and just I, learn more about ourselves on that front. I think that would be that that would be interesting. And I that one the point I wanted to make, sorry, I'm stumbling on my words here, but my experience, Joan, of the conversation that we shared was it wasn't about bridging divides as much as it was about feeling like we could expose different things that we were thinking about at the moment. And so it was really about going deeper with relationships we already had almost more than it was pushing through boundaries. And I feel like that was the most valuable part of it to me in that conversation. COVID had caused us to have a lot of connection, living room conversations around the country. There are different reasons we do living room conversations. If we're doing a political topic, then you really want to make sure you have balance. You don't want one person to feel like they are the only person representing a certain viewpoint. And if you get a bunch of people with the same politics having a political conversation, studies show that they come away from that conversation being more extreme in their view. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't doesn't do bridging. It reinforces our sense of self-righteousness. What we're trying to do is say, okay, who who would you really be curious to have this conversation with? Mm -hmm. The 
technology and relationships conversation, left and right doesn't make a whole lot of difference, but age differences, wow, that tells you a lot. You know, for the connecting across generations conversation, good questions for gathering guide, the first one is, do you remember life before we had mobile phones, tablets, or a time when you were unplugged for an extended period? What did you most enjoy? That's a great conversation. <laughs> and it's oh my crazy. gosh, my mind immediately <laughs> went to reading Harry Potter on trains. <laughs> uh-huh. Absolutely. No, and, and it's it's so well, interesting to yeah. realize that, Summers, you and I have a, such a different experience with reading than our kids do. And I mean, my son doesn't like books at all, but he loves stories. He just gets them from Netflix instead of from, uh, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> Ladies, we could just go continue to dig deeper and deeper in this. And it's such a fascinating uh, toolkit that you guys have created and forum, Joan. Uh, I will add to anyone who is embarking on conversations with family, there is also a fantastic at the very bottom of the friends and family guide, a first aid kit. If you get yourselves in too deep and you need to get out, if inflammation has occurred, how you can (laughs) move back into the sweet and kind part of discussions. So take a look at that on livingroomconversations.org. Christy, I am once again, sadly tasked with being our timekeeper here, yes. but is there anything that you want to ask as we wrap well, up with Joan? Joan, I think you know that we are the Optimist Daily. So we always have to end it by asking our guests for something that they feel optimistic or hopeful from and what's bringing that into your life right now. What's, where's your optimism being sparked? Well, you know, this work sparks my optimism because it brings out the best in everyone. And I am dreaming of this becoming a norm. I mean, Mm. if we can have a culture in which being kind and respectful is the norm, I would be overjoyed. And people are picking these up and they're doing them and they're loving them. So my optimism is that we could have this become a massive movement. Oh, I love it. I love that optimism. We are honored to participate and hopefully further that mission for Living Room Conversations. Thank you so much for being part of the discussion today. Thank you for being on the podcast. Everyone do, if you are an Optimist Daily Emissary, check out this weekend's Optimist View, where Christy will dive deeper into her own experience with her Living Room Conversation. And we will get into the, you know, real knit and grit on how to have a healthy, happy holiday season with open discussions with your family. As always, everyone, thank you for listening to the Optimist Daily Update. We promise to continue to share positive solution-based stories with ideas on how you can participate in this changing world and ensure it is changed for the good. We promise to cover the current events with accuracy, legitimate sources, and offer you the information needed most to chart new paths for all of us. And if you uh, have the means and you are not already, please consider becoming an emissary on theoptimistdaily.com. And for starting at just $5 a month, you can help support reader-funded, independent journalism and be part of the solution-changing consciousness that addresses our world's biggest challenges with that problem-solving mindset. Help us keep the Optimist Daily free to all who need it, supported by those of us who can. Thanks so much, Joan. It was wonderful having you here. Summers, it was great being in this conversation with you. And everybody, thanks for listening. We'll be back on uh, Monday with more solutions.